So we've talked about how the chemical shift delta can tell you about the electronic environment surrounding the nucleus. But there are other pieces of information you can get from an NMR signal. I want in this video to talk about the second piece, which is the integration or the area under the curve. And the integration of the NMR pattern, the signal, the area under the curve, tells you about the number of magnetically equivalent hydrogens that give rise to the signal. So we might see a peak between 7 and 8 parts per million, which would suggest that it's in the aromatic plane. And we might see another peak between 3 and 4, which would suggest that it's near an electromagnetic element. And the relative area of those peaks will allow us to tell how many hydrogen here in the aromatic region, the carbon hydrogen is right there. So, for example, if we have this molecule, which has five hydrogens in the aromatic region and a CH2 group, we might expect. See a two hydrogen integration for that peak and a five hydrogen integration for that peak. In fact, if we went to higher resolution, we wouldn't expect to see just one peak for the aromatic hydrogens because all of those aromatic hydrogens are in fact slightly different. So two of the hydrogens are in what we call the ortho. Where the two position, two of the hydrogens are in what we call the meta position, where the three position, and one of the hydrogens is in the four position or the power position. Those hydrogens are not equivalent. Magnetic equivalence means that they feel identical. Field and thus have identical alpha beta energy gaps. And if they have identical alpha beta energy gaps, they absorb the same radio frequency. Since the chemical shift is effectively a frequency domain, right, by our instrument, which is 7 Tesla magnet for 300 megahertz per proton, this would represent 900 hertz, 300 hertz per part per million, this would represent 1200 hertz right, downfield from the TMS. So they'd be in that 300 megahertz range, but 1200 or 900 hertz different from that type of And if we continued up, We'd expect to see a peak for our internal standard, which is usually quite small because we usually use a very small quantity of TMS, maybe three percent technical cycle. So how do we measure the integration? And what makes hydrogens feel identical effective magnetic fields and thus have identical alpha beta gap and work the same radio frequency? In the old days, it was very low tech. You would simply take a pen and you would scan it along at different frequencies. And when the pen detected some uh, radio frequency energy being emitted, it would rise. And it would keep rising 
until it didn't see any more radio frequency radiation, electromagnetic radiation coming up. So it would rise as it went across the peak, and then it would flatten out again when it went over the peak. And then you keep scrolling, and it would rise across the second peak. And then you take a ruler, and you would measure the amount by which the pen rose as it went across that peak. And you would measure the amount by which the pen rose as it went across the other B, and the number of millimeters, let's say this was 100 millimeters, and this was 40 millimeters, I don't know if I've done that to scale, but 100 millimeters and 40 millimeters, which would tell you that there's a 4 to 10 or 2 to 5 ratio of area under the P here, 334, which is where the CH2 next to the OH would show up, probably closer to 4 because of the density grid as well. And this peak in the aromatic region from 7 to 8 might have been uh, 5 right There should be another peak here. But because alcohols will auto ionize the same way water does, that's what we call an exchangeable hydrogen. It's not attached to that oxygen all the time, because sometimes it's attached as a second hydrogen to the other oxygen. We have an alkoxide and an alkaloxonium ion. Exchangeable hydrogens are very broad, peaks, and variable. So alcohol peaks like this can show up anywhere between 0.5 and 5 parts per million. Let's just say it's here at 2. Right? We would expect another peak. And if this was 100 millimeters and that was 40 millimeters, we expect this one to rise only 20 millimeters because that represents only a single pattern. If I knew that the molecular formula here was C7, H8O, I would know there's a total of eight hydrogens. And a total of 160 millimeters. flat line at the bottom before the pen started seeing any area. And after it was done across the thing, I would divide the height change of 160 millimeters by eight hydrogens. To discover that it's 20 millimeters per hydrogen, and that would allow me to determine that this one must be one hydrogen, and this one must be two hydrogen, and this one must be five hydrogen. Alternatively, you can look for a signal in your spectrum that you know is a single hydrogen. We know that this is unique. It's the only hydrogen attached to oxygen. So we can look for that hydrogen. And if we can find it, we can set the integration to that hydrogen equal to 1, and then do everything to scale, which would be another way of determining 20 millimeters is the amount you would by one hydrogen. Modern instruments will actually often give you just numerical values. But they will give you absolute numerical values of how much radiation it's seeing, not proportional values. You'll still have to adjust your scale so that the number of hydrogens adds up. Usually it'll add up to a lot more than the total number of hydrogens to you. So you should be familiar with both ways, either the horizontal line as it goes across the peaks, or the numerical values. And then you should be familiar with how you can scale that so you can figure out uh, how many hydrogens that actually represents. In this case, pretty simple. Just measure the total height change and divide through by the total number of hydrogens to get the number of millimeters per hydrogen. So that's how the integration is actually measured, old school. And on a modern instrument, that's a numerical value. But what causes hydrogens to be magnetically equivalent to 
first place. And the answer to that is symmetry. Right here is our magnetic point point. point. There is a symmetry operation that can interchange right. And that's usually either a plane of symmetry or a rotation. Either CC sigma bonds rotating around the CC sigma bond or rotating the entire molecule. So 
this would be 40 millimeters. If it was on the same scale as before, this would be 20 millimeters. This would be 40 millimeters. So in high resolution, we would actually see those all separate. We would then see our CH2 group between 3 and 4. And it would be a singlet. And then we would see our OH also as a singlet. Hydrogen would be 40 millimeters, this one 100 would be 20 millimeters. The real power in NMR spectroscopy is in the spine structure, where we see patterns rather than single peaks. And that'll be the subject of the next video when we talk about why those patterns come out the way they do. So that's beyond what we're talking about here. So reflection symmetry, the two orthohydrogens are the same, two metals are the same. Rotational symmetry of the CH2 groups is the same. Both of those give rise to magnetic equivalents. And magnetically equivalent hydrogens, because they have the same alpha beta gap, absorb the same frequency of electromagnetic radiation in the radio frequency range and cause a peak with a greater intensity, a bigger area. So you can look at a structure, and by identifying the number of magnetically distinct peak and how many of each type there are, you can predict what kind of pattern you should see in the MR. So if we were to look, for example, at
and those three hydrogens should show up at, as a triple. So we should actually see a pattern that looks like that. These will be in a one to two to one ratio. These peaks here at the cortex will be in a one to three to three to one ratio. And the reason why is complex. We would report this as delta equals 1.8 ppm. And then in parentheses, we would put the fact that there are three hydrogens giving rise to the signal. We would identify it as a triplet with a T. And then what we would do is we would put the distance between the adjacent peaks in hertz. Often for a plain old alkyl group, that distance between the peaks is somewhere around 7 hertz. J is called the coupling constant. It's field independent, so it's 7 hertz for a 90 megahertz instrument for proton. It's also 7 hertz for 300 megahertz pro instrument. And you report the coupling constant along with the multiplicity.
see a six hydrogen signal for this. It will actually be a doublet. Which will tell us that there's just one adjacent hydrogen. We would expect to see a two hydrogen signal for this. Because these two hydrogens are magnetically equivalent, and we should see a two hydrogen signal for this one. Because there are two adjacent hydrogens, we would expect these two to show up as a double also. And because this one has four adjacent hydrogens, we might expect to see a pentet for that one. It might even be more complicated because these three hydrogens are not the same as, sorry, there's five adjacent hydrogens. We expect to see a sextet. But because these three hydrogens are not the same as those two hydrogens, magnetically, this one's got two chlorines close to it, this one's only got one chlorine close to it, because these are not magnetically the same, they might not have the same coupling constant. And that can cause a non-first order pattern, which will cause even more complexity in the signal. Three signals, though, because there are only three magnetically distinct hydrogens in this case. Besides, in this case, three signals because there are three magnetically distinct hydrogens. Look for planes of symmetry, look for axes of symmetry, look for rotating about carbon-carbon bonds, and that will tell you whether things 